Hello, my name is Janet Lord. I'm a board member of the U.S. International Council on Disabilities, and I'm pleased to share with you today this module entitled Election Access and International Cooperation Programs. It's a module in the online learning series brought to you by USID with the generous support of Rehabilitation International. This module addresses an important issue area in which international cooperation to advance disability inclusion has been very active in a number of regions across the world. The module covers election access in particular and international cooperation programs that help to support disability inclusion in electoral processes. It looks at various practices that have been successful in ensuring that persons with disabilities have access to elections throughout an electoral cycle. The topic addresses one, therefore, very important dimension of international development programming in the context of disability inclusion. So like other modules in this series, this one has several key learning objectives. These are to understand the legal basis for participation in political and public life for persons with disabilities. Second, it aims to assess barriers to political participation and how inclusive development can help to address them. For example, by supporting organizations of persons with disabilities in trying to identify and dismantle electoral access barriers. It aims to identify disability inclusive electoral entry points throughout the electoral cycle. So it helps to think, for example, about how to design an election access project through development assistance. And finally, we hope to share some good practices in inclusive election access and political participation. Let's now turn to the module. So I'd like to begin by looking at the legal framework for inclusive elections and political participation. We begin, of course, with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And in it, Article 29 of the CRPD advances very clearly and specifically the right of persons with disabilities to participate in political and public life. Now, something that's incredibly important and a point that's often missed in electoral access programming is that Article 29 is only one provision in the CRPD relevant for thinking about election access. The, this provision needs to be read together with other important provisions in the CRPD. For example, provisions on accessibility, on non-discrimination and reasonable accommodation, so in Article 5, legal capacity and equal recognition before the law in, in Article 12, and indeed Article 32, the one that we are considering in this module. Article 32, of course, mandates that programs supported by international cooperation are inclusive of persons with disabilities. And many, many international cooperation programs funded by large donors like the EU or the United States, the UK, Australia, the UN, many of these fund election work or democracy and governance programs. All of these ought to be inclusive of persons with disabilities, given that Article 32 requires this, and given that most countries around the world have ratified the CRPD. Now this slide introduces and tries to make explicit the linkage between international cooperation and disability inclusive development in the electoral realm. So democracy and governance programming, as I indicated, is undertaken by a wide variety of actors. This might include election observation undertaken by large international organizations like the United Nations or the EU or the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, 
or by many non-governmental organizations like the Carter Center in my own country, the United States. Programs may also support national election commissions. So the United Nations Development Program and the US Agency for International Development and the EU all provide support for national election commissions strengthening and building, particularly in developing countries. That is a form of international cooperation that is relevant for advancing democratic governance. There's also many programs that support voter education and information campaigns, uh, many of which civil society organizations undertake. They ought to be inclusive of organizations of persons with disabilities, of course. And finally, many of these international cooperation programs operating in this election space or democratic governance space provide support to help marginalized groups raise their voice through an electoral process. And in some cases, programs specifically target organizations of persons with disabilities so that they may help raise the voice of people with disabilities in an electoral process and help break down numerous barriers that persons with disabilities face in exercising their right to vote. Now, an important element of understanding the extent to which people with disabilities have their right to political participation protected is through an assessment of the legal framework. Now this includes, but must extend beyond scoping a country's constitution and their electoral code, but because of course, disability is a cross cutting issue and implicates many different components of the legal framework and the policy framework. So of course we would wanna look at the constitution and the extent to which it protects the right to vote for all people and anti-discrimination legislation and human rights acts, and of course, electoral codes and regulations, we would want to assess all of those to address and understand the extent to which the right to vote is protected and respected, and the extent to which the uh, important principles of accessibility and, and non-discrimination and reasonable accommodation are actually reflected in the frameworks. But we would also want to look at voter registration laws and voting accessibility laws and building standards and codes. We would want to look at guardianship legislation to understand whether there are certain uh, subgroups within the disability community restricted altogether from voting because they may be placed under guardianship. We would want to look at information and communication uh, technology laws. We would want to look at civil codes. Many of those uh, in, in countries with civil codes regulate the issue of legal recognition before the law and legal capacity. And we'd probably also want to look at legislation related to freedom of association for nonprofit organizations, for example, to understand to what extent organizations of persons with disabilities are able to work freely and openly on human rights issues. So these are just a few examples of segments of a legal framework that we would want to be interested in if we were undertaking an assessment um, for the purposes of understanding whether and how the right to participate in political and public life is protected in a particular government context and legal context. So there are many barriers that pose serious obstacles for people with disabilities in exercising their right to the franchise. Some of these are listed on the slide and these derive from experience in a number of different countries where organizations of persons with disabilities have identified problems and barriers that require removal. So of course, specific exclusions in legislation from voting or holding public office based on disability, unfortunately, are still very common in legal frameworks across the world. Provisions about removal from office based on disability and not necessarily linked to performance of a job are also at issue. 
voting rights removed when a guardianship or interdiction proceeding is implemented. Other barriers include no protection against discrimination based specifically on disability and very often legal frameworks provide no duty to provide reasonable accommodation. Lack of mandatory accessibility standards for polling stations is of course a big issue, particularly where our country does not have accessibility standards for buildings. Assisted voting procedures in many places are non-existent or they're provided uh, without the choice of an assistant or other protections that are guaranteed in the CRPD. Very often persons with disabilities and talking about their voting experiences will talk about rude and totally untrained election officials who have no idea how to effectively accommodate a person with a disability who wants to vote. The absence of a focal point on disability inclusive election access in an election management body. Clearly, it's important to have expertise on disability inclusion within a national election commission, for example. Very often, uh, the voice and image of people with disabilities are, are excluded from voter education materials and materials about voting procedures. There's often an absence of flexible voting procedures and materials. And finally, very often, voter observation checklists, those checklists that uh, those who monitor voting processes, very often they do not include any questions at all on access or barriers that voters with disabilities might be experiencing, and that ought to be part of an election observation process. Now this slide presents a diagram, a diagram that identifies various elements that might make up a disability inclusive electoral process in the context of an international cooperation program. So it begins with donor support for disability inclusion, a government commitment to the CRPD and to Article 29 and other articles and it includes four programmatic components that we might think about when designing an election access program. So this, of course, would include inclusive budgeting and disability expertise and engagement with organizations of persons with disabilities. And it would include other elements like capturing uh, information disaggregated on the basis of disability in monitoring an election, for example. It might include disability inclusive training for national election commissions and for people who work at voting centers. It might include training for domestic election observers and for international observers and for voter educators. Such a program supported by international cooperation might also include uh, auditing of accessible sites for uh, inclusive voting and accessible procedures and materials. And of course, it might also include a needs assessment done at the very beginning of an electoral process to understand better what barriers voters with disabilities might experience and then to help design a program that seeks to redress those particular barriers. Now this slide depicts the electoral process as a cycle with various phases, six in particular. These phases include election planning, voter information and education, voter registration, election campaigning and the work of political parties, election day operations and election observation on that day, and then post-election planning and reform and legal framework review. So the cycle is clearly one that continues. Now this slide shows some entry points for disability inclusion throughout the electoral cycle. 
It gives some ideas for how we might want to think about designing an international cooperation program focused on disability inclusive interventions in an electoral process. So for election planning phase, we might want to be thinking about polling site selection and making modifications at polling sites to ensure accessibility. For example, voting on the first floor where uh, floors are not necessarily uh, uh, accessible, um, budgeting for reasonable accommodations that might be required for voters with disabilities, and of course doing pre-election technical assessments. In the voting information and education part of the cycle, we'll of course want to think about engaging with organizations of persons with disabilities and outreach and thinking about poll worker training on disability access and media training as well. In the voter registration phase, we might want to be thinking about how to ensure that persons with disabilities are engaging in voter registration so that they may be able to exercise their right to vote doing uh, voter registration outreach, perhaps helping with transportation and so forth. For the election campaigning uh, process, we might want to be thinking about engagement with political parties so that they ensure that their party platforms actually include the needs and interests of persons with disabilities and that their election campaign materials are actually provided in accessible formats for persons with disabilities. For the election day operations and election observation, we would want to, of course, have thought already about accessible ballot design and inclusive electoral observation so that observers uh, are actually thinking about access issues and so that persons with disabilities themselves are engaged as domestic election observers or international observers. We'd want to think about accessible dispute resolution if there are issues and problems relating to access. And in the post-election period, we would certainly want to look at the need for possible law reform or procedural reform. We would want to look very carefully at election observation information and analyze uh, election observation results for accessibility findings. So the next section addresses some of the emerging good practices in election access. And these are drawn from those programs funded through international cooperation and those funded by national governments. It follows the entry points that we've just examined for disability inclusion throughout the election cycle. Now, many other good practice examples can be found in the resources listed at the end of this presentation. So at the planning stage, opportunities for assessing the accessibility of polling centers to voters with disabilities are very important. And this might include burial removal at polling centers or making plans for modifications and undertaking accessibility audits. The diagram on this particular slide is drawn from an American uh, resource that is depicting an accessible path for travel into a polling station. Of course, organizations for persons with disabilities can be invaluable in this process. In an international cooperation program funded by the United States, organizations of persons with disabilities in the country of Jordan in the Middle East undertook very comprehensive accessibility audits of polling centers to try to identify barriers and then plan for removal. Jordan has made tremendous progress in ensuring that its polling centers are accessible for persons with disabilities. Campaigning to expose barriers to political participation is a very common and very successful approach for organizations of persons with disabilities. Now, this particular slide shows an Egyptian poster campaign, an organization devoted to election access for persons with disabilities, had a very famous Egyptian cartoonist, a political cartoonist, do a series of 
artistic posters. This particular one shows a worried voter who was a wheelchair user at the bottom of a set of stairs. And on the top of the stairs on the landing is a totally inaccessible ballot box. The next slide shows uh, voter education using positive images of voters with disabilities. This is an example of a good practice from Uganda, also supported by international cooperation and ensuring that organizations of persons with disabilities are working on election access through voter awareness and education. There's other examples of accessible voter information efforts in countries like Finland and in Germany. The Finnish Ministry of Justice produced easy to understand election videos in both Finnish and Swedish on how to vote in elections and how to cast a ballot. They also did voter education and information using uh, audio CD and, and Braille and making it possible for people with visual impairments to study district candidates lists independently. In Germany, a easy to read guide for the German parliamentary elections was done, uh, which answers frequently asked questions in an accessible language and format. Voter materials can highlight the accessible features of polling sites or provide accessible pictorial illustrations of election procedures that can be incredibly useful for all voters and particularly helpful for voters who may not be able to read or perhaps for voters who are deaf and are unable to communicate effectively um, if there are no sign language interpreters in a voting uh, center. If you like, you can press on the video viewing from the Election Commission of India to see another good practice. This slide uh, emphasizes that accessible balloting materials and procedures are really important to ensure full access. This shows a picture of a blind voter from India casting his ballot with assistance. Tactile ballot guides, like the one depicted here, are paper folders with cutouts next to each candidate on the ballot. The ballot can be placed inside this tactile guide to assist a voter who is blind or who has low vision to determine where to place his or her mark. They are cheap to produce and easy to use. This is one from West Africa. In uh, a number of African countries, tactile ballot guides have been used very successfully by blind voters. Many of these have been supported through international cooperation grants. Assisted voting procedures are also, of course, very important for persons with disabilities. Voting machines and tables for voters with disabilities need to have an appropriate height so that, for example, a voter with a wheelchair has easy access. The image here illustrates a clear line of sight for a voting machine for a voter who's a wheelchair user. The table height is also something incredibly important for thinking about accessibility. We might also need to think about glare on a screen from a range of different positions to ensure appropriate accessibility. This image shows a well-designed keyboard. The keys are spaced nicely apart. They have tactile elements and the color is contrasted with the background. These elements are very important for persons with low vision, for example. The EU Fundamental Rights Agency undertook a study of the election access uh, barriers for persons with disabilities across the European Union, and they developed indicators to help member states in monitoring the accessibility of participation in political life for voters with disabilities. This slide provides a direct link to the report 
and provide some examples of the indicators that this project came up with. Things to think about, such as restrictions on the right to vote of persons without legal capacity, or the legal requirement to register to vote, or alternative ways of voting. Some of the outcome indicators that this project came up with included accessibility of polling stations, accessibility of public buildings, accessibility of information websites or websites for an election commission, and so forth. Many of the other indicators reflected in that report by the EU Fundamental Rights Agency can be incredibly helpful, helpful in guiding uh, civil society actors and persons with disabilities, national election commissions, in thinking about designing for fully inclusive electoral processes. There are a variety of other interventions that might be undertaken to advance election access. Some of these include the following. Disability inclusion in all pre-electoral assessments. So looking at the law and the policy and programming from a disability lens. Training of election officials on election access. Designing accessible election materials. Engaging OPDs in civil society voter education and information campaigns. Ensuring the voice and image of people with disabilities in election materials and in information campaigns, whether on radio or TV or in print. Ensuring disability inclusion in election monitoring and engaging OPDs in post-election review and reform processes. And there are many other useful resources that can help provide guidance in designing and implementing election access programming consistent with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Some of these are reflected on the slide. Thank you.